the biggest piece by far in this book is the last one, uh, which Liszt gave the title Après une lecture du Dante, Fantasy à quasi sonata. Uh, as anyone who speaks French will tell you, it probably should be Après une lecture de Dante. Um, <coughs> but Du is what he wrote. Um, <coughs> and he did speak French, but uh, the reason we think that it's probably a mistake is because of um, the title itself comes from a poem by Victor Hugo, and where it is definitely de. Anyway, once we sort the title out, this is a piece with a fascinating history, and Liszt began it in 1839. The version that we have is, of course, the one that was printed uh, when this book was first uh, through the press in, I think it's 1854. Well, <coughs> This piece had a very complicated history. All the other pieces have got earlier versions, but they don't differ very markedly from the final version, except with the introduction of the 104th Petrarch sonnet. But this piece was originally divided into two. Well, he didn't call them movements. Uh, when he got to the end of the first section, uh, he wrote uh, that it's the end of part one, and, um, and he ca comes to a full stop in F-sharp major uh, in the middle of it. By the time he gets it into its third version, um, we are comfortably in sonata form, and then he comes up with the idea of calling it Fantasia Quasi Sonata. To be brief, but to try and get this thing understood to the bottom, there is a missing early manuscript, which was probably called Fragment Dantesque, in other words, a, fra a, a, a Dante fragment, which we know he played under that title, and, but we don't have anything with that title written on it. What we do have is the earliest manuscript, which is not in Liszt's hand, it's in the hand of a copyist, so in other words, it was made from Liszt's manuscript. And by this point, the piece's title is Paralipomen a la Divina Commedia. And Paralipomen is a word that you don't really encounter very much in music. You will see it in philosophy, you will see it occasionally in religious studies. The ones who care about such things probably know that the two books of Chronicles are referred to as the Paralip Paralipomena to the two books of Kings in the Old Testament, for example. Either way, it just means information around the idea of the Divina Commedia. And we do not know at all which lines of the poem were the inspiration for any of it. It is very likely to me that most of it is firmly grounded in the first book, in other words, Inferno. And the piece begins in all the four versions of it with these marvelous <laughs> tritones, which, as we all know, was regarded from medieval times as Diablos in Musica, because <clears throat> a tritone can't belong properly to any of the modes and and it is always, even in, in tonal harmony, nearly always requires some kind of resolution. And Liszt always had fun with this interval. And if you look at a piece as late as the second Mephisto Waltz, um, which starts with... and ends with... and doesn't resolve it. Of course, there it's also representing the devil. So the, he's, he's quite consistent in the way he uses this in his life. Back to the history of the piece. The first manuscript, which is in the copyist's hand, is also absolutely riddled with lists, uh, additions, corrections, and pasteovers. So what we essentially have is a second version of a piece of which we do not have the first version anymore. So 
that we have to be content with that. One of the tricky bits is that the copyist's copy seems not to have been completely accurate in all passages, and there are some, just some oddities that escaped Liszt's uh, sight when, when, it, when eventually it got copied out again and again, and some of the things that look like errors get perpetuated from one copy to the next, and he doesn't pick them up. For example, uh, in bar 65, there's a very peculiar happening in the left hand. Um, it, it could have been, or could have been, as it is a couple of bars before. But what it almost certainly isn't is, but we don't have Liszt's hand of that bar in any of the four extant um, sources. So um, we have to put up with the fact that that's probably a mistake. There are some other notes in this piece which we'll come to where there is some kind of doubt about the text and no edition manages to convey, I don't think fairly, what the possible readings are because they nearly all only look at one source. And the source of the, of, the, of the published version of the Dante Sonata is a manuscript in the hand of Raff, which is based on another manuscript, which is a further copy of the first one, in which Liszt then pasted a load of pages of extra writing and made a lot of alterations on the face of the text. And this copy by Raff has some awful mistakes in it, and Liszt doesn't seem to have noticed them when they got uh, set into um, type. He did, though, have another look at this piece, and uh, right at the last moment he made a few changes, and there, and there in, in this um, copyist copy, in Liszt's handwriting. So, <clears throat> sort of, the text we have is, is what his final view is, except that he missed a few things um, from previous manuscripts, that he's probably intended to copy exactly, even though he's changed some of the shapes of the chords. So there's some very famous funny notes in this piece. We shall get to them. <coughs> right at the beginning, Liszt writes forte. He only writes forte. He does not write fortissimo. Fortissimo is coming later, and there is a lot of loud music in this piece. But what he doesn't do is write a diminuendo at the end of the first phrase. And I think it's one of the least helpful performance efforts is to play. Because that isn't it at all. This is the first time this music has settled on a chord of any sort. And he's going to settle on that one, that one, and eventually that's going to be the key of the piece. So it's very important, I think, to establish this progression of chords very clearly. So... Then there's a pause, which is very frequently not observed in performance. The next bit says più moto. It just means a bit more movement. We've been in andante maestoso which incidentally I believe should be played absolutely in tempo. Um, there's a lot of people play uh, a rubato where they get faster and then they get slower every time you have that descending bunch of tritones, which I think is completely wrong. This one is only a little faster because after all, you have got to get a lot faster before you are much older and <laughs> 
is enough tempo for my money because you've got to have... Here in virtually every score ever printed of this sonata is written written molto. But it's not by list. And I'm at a loss, and I've looked, um, to find out where it comes from. But even in Urtext editions, this written molto crops up. And um, I think it should be ignored. Because otherwise, you have absolutely no way of counting the next two bars in order to convey any sense at all from to that. At this stage, I would also caution never to add all of the notes that some editor suggests that you ought to. I can think of nothing worse than going and putting in the bottom A. Liszt does write the bottom A in this piece, but it's not for a very long time. It's, it's right almost at, at the end of the work, really, where he writes... So this is something he's keeping up his sleeve, it, as he often does. We all remember that in the B minor sonata, this bottom note is simply not present in the work until the last bar. So nobody should alter the text of that and add any Bs anywhere else. The Presto Agitato Assai throws up several problems in this piece. If you see the, the manuscript of the first version, um, the left-hand chords are just part of D minor chord, so his very long pedal direction is much more playable in that version than it turns out to be in the final one. It was also notated in 2-4 with all the, all the notes being, that's a whole bar in the first, first version, and they're written in quavers. And so Presto Agitato Assai probably works better there than it does here. In fact, he thought about changing it to Allegro Agitato Assai and then uh, changed his mind again. Either way, it's really going to have to be played Allegro because it can't be played Presto because you have to take your tempo from eventually what you're going to do with... And that, that has to be at a reasonable tempo, so that gives you roughly... And since he wants it to be played lamentoso, I don't think you can play Lamentoso if you're playing too much too fast there. The, the, pe the pedal, you've got to try and hold it and, and do something with it in order for it not to be quite as muddy as that because it, it really doesn't come off. In 1839, and with the left hand staying on the same chords, It's not so messy at all. But now he, he has decided that... ..have the left hand follow the line of the right hand. It makes the pedalling a, 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 a real job to get, get sorted. At the end of this long opening paragraph, uh, it is very tempting to get much faster um, because it's, it, well, it's, it's, it's a very exciting passage, but once you've got... Um but if you get carried away, especially coming down the last one of these uh, blind octave scales, um, you, so you find people ending... because it says più animato here. But remember that this più animato can't be too much più animato because there's no tempo change marked when we get out of 
the D minor into F sharp major, which is the key of the second subject, which is... So, if unless you want to put the brakes on later, it's as well to hold the tiger a bit here. And it means that when you get... this um, sorted out version of the uh, opening. So in other words, the tritone has now become a fifth and, and it stays a fifth. Then, then fourth. In order to get us to F sharp major. Uh, interestingly, when he first wrote this, uh, he didn't have that um, trumpet tune at all. He just has Just, just as the chords. Also interesting is that this, that chord is notated in the first version, uh, A natural, F, D flat, which for me settles the argument once and for all about what the chord at the second half of bar 102 is. What's actually printed and what's in Raff's handwriting is, which is untenable for several reasons, but um, the very least of which is that if you've spent a whole page getting yourself to F sharp major, why on earth would you at the last moment deny yourself the leading note? And the second is that the chord is written wrongly because the C sharp ought to be an E sharp. And there's no need for a C sharp because the C sharp's already in the key signature whereas there is every need for an E-sharp if you want to make a proper cadence into F-sharp major and have... But Liszt didn't spot it when he did the proofreading because he was busy looking at the next bar because the next bar until the very last minute read... And he had this great stroke of... Impro uh, of um, Genius to go. So these extra notes with the Swartzandi on are his last addition to this passage. When we get to the end of the second subject, uh, we come back to the tritones and we have the same problem in performance that people very often do an enormous diminuendo in the middle. So it should be... Because the next one, he really does want a diminuendo. And a ritonoto as well. Which is why we should not even dream of substituting the last chord for because it's not a sequence anymore. Of course we know that every other time it ends on a major chord, but this time we need the C sharp because we do not want to have a false relation with what's coming. So I don't think there's any doubt, there's certainly no doubt in the sources that in every, in every version of this piece that note is a C sharp but there are many additions who put a double sharp in brackets, but my firm advice is to cross it out and play exactly what the man wrote. It's a wonderful moment that comes straight after this where he asks you to play andante quasi improvisato and dolcissimo con intimo sentimento and with una corda. And since it is very tempting to play loud all the way through this piece, it's very important to find all of the places where it can be more intimate and very quiet and very gentle. And some of the writing that this employs in these passages is absolutely magical. So don't be in any hurry with any of, any of it. 
and when you get eventually to the, the ne next andante, which is essentially going to be the same tempo as the one you've just had, but instead of quasi improvisato, it's, you're going to have to sit still and play. So it's important to play this much more uh, in time and in, in meter. Unfortunately, the new list edition has suggested that you take your foot off the unicorda at this point. It is true that list writes unicorda again in bar 157, but I don't think that this should be full-blooded uh, loud. I think we're, the last t um, dynamic before bar 136 is pianissimo, which is in this bar. And when he says ben marcato il canto, I think it's probably best to lean in the general direction of your thumb, because otherwise you're going to have a fairly unpleasant octave shift at here. comes out a bit better balanced. The next page has one of the places where a lot of young players uh, in their zeal uh, miss completely the rhythm and it's this. Where Liszt writes lagrimoso and un poco rallentando. So lagrimoso means as we know tearful and the rhythm, if you didn't have the triplets in the right hand, wouldn't be any problem at all, and everyone would play. But what happens very often is that the semiquaver gets turned into the sixth part of a beat, and you have... which is simply not what he wrote, and in any case, cannot possibly come out sounding lagrimoso. So make sure, we should always, that this rhythm is absolutely correct. After that, we have one of the most magical passages in the whole work where he writes dolcissimo con amore. And and you just have to risk the pedal and it's going to work out just fine. And you can take all the time you want and it's got to sound like something that was invented by angels on the, on the spur of the moment, but that it was perfect. So when he writes affretando, it's affretando in the context of something that's otherwise very gentle. And uh, keep the lid on it. The next page, uh, he already had this great idea of repeating the first eight, uh, first four bars. Sorry, in the in the first version, they they only come once, uh, and then he asks for them to be doubled. So it gives you more time to get from accelerando to sempre accelerando and rinforzando, and then the final explosion when you reach fortissimo. So just make sure that you pace it properly because you don't want to get too fast for... <laughs> then we come to one of the great textual problems. The first edition marks the right hand to be played con ottava ad libitum. Now it's a physical impossibility 
But if you are playing... You can't actually play with your right hand. So you can't actually do con ottava ad libitum. You can do con ottava for some of the notes, but not for where the chords are. But what's actually in the manuscript is al ottava ad libitum. In other words, which uh, makes a lot more sense because you can actually do it. And it's still ad libitum, so you, in fact you could just play if you wanted to. Then we come to this allegro moderato, which is marked pianissimo and sotto voce, and eventually has some very remarkable pedal directions which are observed by almost nobody. First thing, the allegro moderato is nearly always played much too fast, but think that at bar 199 it's going to go... and get a little faster as we go and get more frenetic, uh, where it's agitato and poco poco crescendo. So you don't want to start that too fast, but it also gives you some kind of clue because of the nature of the writing to what the real tempo way back uh, around, well, from bar 35 onwards, uh, was pr what, what the real tempo was probably intended to be rather than presto. So that's important to look at. But the, the, the pedal direction, you have to be a little careful and you can hold on to some notes with your fingers to make it work. But Liszt's pedal goes... And he knew that that was messy, but you have to do something with it. What you're not really, uh, uh, I don't think, allowed to do is... ..which is what almost everybody does, because that completely flouts his pedal direction. But if you want to make it a bit clearer, you just have to hang on to a few notes. get somewhere a bit closer to what he's asking for. Then don't get too fast with the next bit because it's going to get embarrassing uh, once the right hand starts jumping around and the left hand instead of suddenly goes and you don't want to put any kind of ritonuto in it. And you don't want to get too fast either because the very next thing he says is stringendo which is And very cleverly, he writes one very long and noisy pedal. And then no pedal at all. And this is often not observed either. Then he writes Pumosa. But you have to remember what's coming, which is... And keep that in mind when you do the Pumosa so you don't have to slow down later. The only other thing to observe is in bar 224, where the rhythm previously having gone, now goes, and so we shouldn't miss that. We get then to the noisiest passage, which comes down then to one of the most delicate ones, and it's very marvelous the way he gets from sempre marcatissimo, which is There's one problematic chord in this passage. Uh, List, as you probably know, never repeated his clefts and his key signatures for page after page. And 
I'm of the opinion that he might just have forgotten whether there was a B-flat in the key signature. But, and uh, in here I agree with Jose Viana da Motta in the old uh, Gesamtausgabe that the chord in 262.3 should probably be E-flat major. for a couple of reasons. One, because it belongs much better to the harmonic language of this second subject. And um, by the way, this, this passage is, is a bit messy in the autograph because most of it is in the hand of the copyist and there are just some, some odd notes written in Liszt's hand uh, when he's rewriting the triplet passages for on the third staff. Bar 256, for example, the question is whether it should be, which is what the, what the harmony has done heretofore. But the addition of the E natural is a little bit troublesome because when he then does, he doesn't do, And then, as if to start another sequence, uh, you've got the first one starting in B major, second one in G major, and you would think the third one, faked, because it's not going to be completed, would have to be E flat major, not an augmented triad. Now, it is true that Liszt uses an augmented triad very often and to great effect, but the fact that it is used here to so little effect and you can't draw attention to it anyway. It seems to be a harmonic gesture that is just not worked out. So um, I am personally convinced that it should be a B-flat. I know there are people who disagree with me, but at least have a think about it. At the Andante, at bar 290, we have well, one performing problem and one text problem. The performing problem is usually that the tremolos sound awkward and the tune doesn't sing enough. And one way around it is to play, in other words, play the arpeggio on the left hand chord starting on the beat and therefore in rhythmic unison with the first two notes of the tremolo. We come to <coughs> one of the controversies because it is true that the Raff manuscript and the first edition both carry a G natural in the next bar. But it seems such a violation uh, to the theme that it's rather splendid to notice that in the manuscript of the first two versions the text goes... And since the prevailing winds are blowing towards A major, a G, a G natural is such a, a foreign note to have put in this bar that it seems to me that he would have had to put a precautionary natural on it in order to make it seem convincing. Uh, in any case, I think because of the evidence of the first two versions of the piece, uh, he had G sharp in his head and G sharp's what he meant, even though at some point he must have failed to write one down. And didn't miss it, and, and missed it in the proof. And of course, two bars later, there's G sharps everywhere because we're in A. At the Pumoso, it's very important not to misinterpret Sforzando as fortissimo because there are four bars which must keep on getting louder and more intense and only getting to fortissimo at bar 304. Uh, and I firmly recommend to take the pedal off on that note so that those, the next 
for semi-quavers are entirely without pedal. We can be very grateful that this was Liszt's last moment decision because up to then it went. With far too many notes in. And if you consult, uh, the new list edition has printed that version in one of the supplements. And it also includes the extremely wicked passage at the end that list cut out at the last moment. So then we don't want to play this Allegro too fast because Poco Poco Più di Moto is coming, and then Allegro Vivace, and then Presto, and then uh, the end. And in order to make this all work, it all has to be done very gradually so that comes in with some kind of, we can still move a little faster. And we have to move faster yet at, and you don't want to move that too fast either because at the end of that, there are some chords that are very difficult to negotiate. Uh, right until the 11th hour, this piece ended with, passage of some terrifying difficulty and which I think he probably realized even though it's in all of the three preceding versions of the sonata in one form or another that finally he'd made it too difficult and it was going to be too exhausting so he changed that got rid of those eight bars and extended the rising scale with these last three chords but added the ritonuto as well it's a pity to spread those chords if you don't have to. But if you hold the tempo well enough at the end with the ritonuto, you can actually reach down and play the C natural and the C sharp with your right hand. If you play... You can do that and there's no harm done. And once you do that, you really must put in at least one quaver of silence before you start. And then there's only one more observation, really, and that is that his pedal direction must be strictly observed here. Now, from here to the end, he writes the pedal where it goes down, but he doesn't say where it should come up. Uh, people usually feel that the piano isn't allowed enough instrument to play the end of this work, and a lot of people, at least in the last bar but one, use two hands to play the tremolos. So, so that they can make it come out a bit louder. Um, if, if you do that, just do it with some discretion because it can sound suddenly very ugly. Um, but I think it's very worthwhile to clean the pedal uh, as soon as you strike the last note because you don't want any F-sharp lingering in it anywhere. So... And in order to make the right hand as loud as it possibly can be in the last bar, you have enough time to organise your hand so that you can put thumb and second finger on the A and fourth and fifth on the D so you can definitely play with the weight of your whole shoulder and arm in order to make the last note loud enough. There's a lot of things to do in this piece, but they're all worth doing, and it should come out, as all big lists should, uh, as something of nobility and grandeur and elegance at the same time. It is very easy to play this piece uh, in a sort of intense and muddy kind of a way where people come away less than thrilled and they don't think they've had a Dantesque experience at all, particularly. Uh, it's very easy, of course, to convey the, the nastiest atmosphere of Inferno, but 
it's much it's a much better balanced piece than that and it's really much more cleverly constructed and our job is of course to make the musical sense of the piece uh, before all other things most of which can be done if you just do exactly what he tells you